Hey, what is up, everybody? Welcome to Cyber Office Hours, episode 95, uh, Friday, May 20th, 2022. Hope you guys are doing great. I uh, hope everybody's had a good week so far. I hope everybody's experiencing some decent weather. We're here in the 60s. It's overcast. It's nice. It's cool. It's not too hot, not too cold. It's just great. Uh, I am also here with my little darling, Olive, who many of you guys have been asking about. So she's hanging out on the couch with me here. And uh, maybe she'll get up here in a second. Let's see if we can tip this down. Maybe you can see. Hi, little baby girl. Yep, just hanging out with her daddy. And she's a good girl. And the uh, other dogs are loafing about in other parts of the house uh so how are you guys doing today what is going on uh this week has been as with every week just absolutely bananas uh i'm so freaking busy uh i can't even i can't even think straight uh we got lots of uh classes we got lots of private sessions uh i'm working on a really really big project right now i can't really tell you anything about it yet um but suffice it to say like i got my great big behavior books uh all sorts of bookmarks making all sorts of uh highlighted notes and stuff like that and, uh, it's a lot of fun actually uh these and I keep trying to, I'm trying not to take over the entire living room with my jazz. So I get some books out, I make some notes, I use them, reference them, and then put them back and get different ones out. Thank goodness for my professional library. But uh, yeah, uh, it's been busy. We got an intern coming to shadow all day Saturday, which is, uh, I think this is just some 18 year old girl that uh, from Bosies, who I I met when we were doing career day um, at Bosies. So Bosies is kind of like our um, like trade school. Um, you know, they have like animal science and cosmetology and uh, uh, criminal science and um, like uh, building trades and um, agriculture. Well, there's all sorts of stuff that they do, and then different school districts uh, bust their kids in. And actually, that's where my wife, Christy, teaches is at one of the campuses. She's their science teacher, so she goes around and does different science classes, different science lessons, I should say, in the different classes as opposed to, you know, uh, uh, related to what they're working on. Uh, she's done some neat stuff for the forensics class, uh, for the cooking, you know, the culinary arts. Uh, she's done some neat stuff with that. So, um, where was I going with that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I met this uh, girl during career day. So I go in with the uh, the animal sciences. Uh, I work with them, the two instructors there. Really cool people. Um, and uh, they have a career day at BOCES where they have all the kids per participate in mock interviews based on the professions that they may or may not want to go in. And so I went and did several mock interviews and now this girl wants to shadow with us. So she's going to come hang out Saturday uh, and watch us do four private sessions, which would be a long day. Uh, even, even for us, we usually do three, um, but we're doing four that day. So, so it should be interesting. And then hopefully I'll get to talk about this project soon. And uh, then I can loaf around a little olive and get back to other things. Gee, many Christmas, I got to get back onto the, this is really just taking like every spare second I have. Uh, so we got to get back to the YouTube. We got to get back to uh, the Patreon. We got to get back to the syndicate. <laughs> I need to uh, develop curriculum. Um, it's a madhouse here, but it's it's uh, 
wouldn't change a thing. So, hey, let's see who the warm bodies are here. Uh, there's my buddy Nick from the Netherlands. Uh, I hope you have a good weekend too, my friend. Uh, good to see you here. There's my buddy Mike. Good morning, longtime listener, first time caller. No, you're not. <laughs> it's good to see you take a break from making all those neat bags and stuff I see on Instagram. I know you're a busy man like I am. Let's see here. Jackie Mars. Hey, first timer. Welcome, Jackie. Good to see you here. Thank you for tuning in to the show. I don't usually do them in the living room area. Usually I'm in my office, but uh, honestly, my laptop needed to be charged and I wanted to hang out with little Olive so you guys could see her. Uh, Hannah, be well. Hi, Olive. It's supposed to be 90 tomorrow. Oh, God. I hate summer. I hate the heat. It's so gross. Uh, there's my mom. Good day to you. Hi, Olive. Grandma says hi, Olive. Yeah, Grandma says hi. What are you doing down there, huh? What are you doing? She's like, I'm just hanging out. Uh, there's Kim. Hey, Kim. Good to see you. Good to see you. Uh, Ariel, hey Ian, we noticed that Tucker's being too interested in younger kids and lunges as they walk past or run past. How would you suggest getting practice reps in? Well, uh, I mean, if you have the option to work farther away, that would be the best. Um, proximity is always a big piece of, uh, trying to get them, uh, to be, you know, uh, I just realized I'm streaming on YouTube. I didn't mean to do that. I meant to go to uh, Twitch. What the hell am I doing on YouTube? God bless America. Uh, distance and proximity are always big indicators for, uh, are big factors in any kind of reactivity piece. And so if you can create distance between your dog and the trigger, that's usually the first and best thing you can do to get the threshold get your dog under the threshold so that you can kind of re-engage that cognitive functions and start doing some work. So, uh, you know, if you are talking about context where you're just like, I don't know, walk or something like that, that might not be a conducive place to work on that kind of thing. So you might find like, uh, a playground somewhere like, so for example, at our park right or down the road here, we've got this massive, massive park. Um, you know, I've taken some of my clients down there to hang out outside the playground and you can get a good deal away. You can be anywhere from, you know, right up on the playground to even 100, 200 yards away in some cases, depending on which direction you go. And then, uh, you know, you can kind of find that sweet spot where you're just kind of tickling the threshold, um, but you still have all those cognitive functions online so you can do the work. Um, and of course, then we would work on our attention control and our boomerang stuff that we've talked about many times on the channel here. So I would really recommend that that's kind of uh, the first part is trying to find a, a smart setup to do that work in so that your dog isn't too overwhelmed and their intent, their uh, responses aren't too intense uh, so that you can get into that work that work. Uh, there's Janet. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Good morning, Janet. Good talking to you. Uh, how are things going with your uh, CPDT? Uh, I'd like to hear about that. If you got in touch, I haven't heard from Hannah. If you got in touch with her or not. Um, Barbara, hi from Nashville. Hey, Barbara. Good to see you there. Tammy, hello. It was great to meet you this week with Smokey. <laughs> Absolutely. Yep, it was. We were just talking about Smokey yesterday. He's such a cool little dude. Uh, and I'm looking forward to working with you guys some more. <laughs> awesome. Thanks for stopping by, Tammy. Uh, there's my buddy Rich. Good to see you there, my friend. I uh, hope things are well at your end. Uh, there's Amelia from France. Good to see you. Thank you for stopping by. This is all, I love that we have <clears throat> so many people from all over the world. Jennifer Ann Turner, best part of the week. Thank you. Uh, Barney is, is our seven-month-old rescue. We've had him three months. He's enrolled. Re I'm going to get under the threshold here so I can re-engage my cognitive functions. Good grief. I can't even talk this morning. He is enrolled in a real-life rover obedience class. So that's cool. I like that name. 
Uh, he's learning well using your techniques and some of theirs. Great, great, great. Uh, however, the classes are really tough because he barks like crazy the entire time. He won't stop and he won't settle down for more than a couple minutes. The trainer has tried blocking his vision with gates and giving him lots of treats. The treats help temporarily, but he gets full. It looks like it cut off your comment there. It was kind of too long. I couldn't see it. Um, but I think that you're saying that he gets too full and then they're probably less uh, less useful. Um, so a couple things, uh, usually if you get into a group class situation and you, your dog, uh, is really kind of excited or aroused by that situation, uh, to where they're barking a lot and they're carrying on. Usually that's an indication that a group class isn't necessarily a good fit yet in their development. Um, I know that there's a there's a big kind of thing where people are like, well, I want to take my dog to group classes, you know, to help socialize them. And group classes are not really the appropriate place to do socialization because it's such an artificial kind of setup. You know, you're in, in an enclosed space with a bunch of dogs in proximity. You've got an instructor that's trying to do things and people trying to concentrate. Um, and so usually I try to tell people that you go to classes to learn what to do so that you can go home and do it. Um, and if your dog is disruptive or they're distracted too much, then, you know, maybe private training might be a better thing for you. In your case, you know, I'm not there. I don't know how well, uh, Barney is responding or not responding or how disruptive or not disruptive he is. So it's hard to say. Um, uh, but you know, even though we screen our classes, we try hard to screen our classes. And if your dog is, if a dog is, you know, really too jazzed up, we'd be like, Hey, you know, maybe private classes might be better for you guys. You know, and sometimes we get into week two or three and a dog all of a sudden comes out of their shell, you know, maybe the first couple of weeks they were a little suppressed, uh, and they start making some noise. And so in those cases, then we really focus on just engagement with that dog because, they're not really in the right headspace to do very well with the obedience pieces. And so we don't really expect them to do a whole lot. We really just focus on the engagement stuff. And so I would mention, you know, uh, the trainer blocking the vision isn't bad. That stimulus blocking, we've done that before. Um, gosh, earlier this week, we had a class <clears throat> where a lab and a border collie all of a sudden decided that they were going to talk to each other during the class, like not aggressively. They were just like, hey, you, what are you doing over there? Oh, I'm over here with my owner. So we've got like these uh, separator boards that I have and we just put it up between them and that solved the problem. No worries. Um, so stimulus blocking is a good idea, but the treats need to be contingent on something. If you're just giving the treats non-contingently, Sometimes that's okay. You're doing some classical conditioning, some responding conditioning, and, and that's okay. But most of the time, turning it into an operant kind of thing, some kind of an operation so that it's contingent on engagement with you, and then you just work on the engagement. Uh, and then if you are treating the food like a toy, like I recommend, if you're having the dog chase the food, um, you know, if you're fluent with our system where you're like, yes, and then you move and the dog comes and gets the food and you're treating the food like a toy, you can usually get more work out of it. They'll stay a little bit more invested even when they're starting to fill up. So, uh, you know, just a lot of food for thought, a lot of moving parts there. Um, and you'll kind of have to see how that goes. If you get to where you feel like I just spend the entire class time managing Barney and I'm missing some of the material and Barney isn't getting to participate in some of the material, then that's when you might have to say, well, we might need to move to private training for a little bit um, just to get some of these basic skills under our belt uh, and rebuild some of our engagement. Um, and maybe even move Barney through adolescence, seven month old rescue. That's right in adolescence. And as you've heard me say, every adolescent dog is some version of an idiot. Uh, and so sometimes, you know, you kind of just get through the uh, really crazy parts of adolescent, build some of those basic skills on your own, and then you can kind of try the group classes again. But like I said, I don't know. I'm just spitballing. I, I, I don't, I'm not standing there. I don't know. Um, you know, the nuances of what how you guys are doing in class, but just some things to think about while you're doing it. 
Caesar, can you hear Chesty and Frankie barking? Hello, you should because they still can't stop working on it. <laughs> hey, Caesar, good to see you, man. <laughs> uh, the handsome little dudes. It was good talking to you earlier this week. Uh, Isabel, hi from YouTube. I know. What am I doing on YouTube? Well, this is good. We'll get this video out there. Um, Lisa. Hi, Ian. My daughter has a year-old Mastiff Pity who rests, resource guards her. Any suggestions? Getting very aggressive with lunging, snarling, growling, and will bite. Um, okay, so resource guarding uh, is potentially a detailed process to get through, um, especially when they are guarding a person, if they're kind of possessive of a person. Usually when you get to resource guarding, resource guarding is always... Uh, an expression of some kind of uh, anxiety about the resource in question. Um, so I find that in when a dog is guarding a person, you know, they're like, well, they're, they're guarding me, they're protecting me. Uh, and it's usually more of a possessive kind of thing, you know. Um, so I would really recommend, I'm going to give you some pointers and some things to think about, but I'd really recommend getting in touch with a local pro. Because what really needs to happen to work through resource guarding productively is you got to sit down with your trainer and you've got to lay out like all the pieces. Okay, so what are our positive indicators? What are our negative indicators uh, in the case? Uh, what are the parameters of the guarding context? You know, is it all the time? Is it only in certain contexts? Uh, what is the threshold? Is uh, the dog only guarding against certain people that approach uh, your daughter or is it everybody? You know, um, we have to kind of get all these pieces out uh, so that we can form an intelligent protocol. And then a good trainer who's experienced in resource guarding would then design uh, a hierarchy for you to work through. And so then that hierarchy uh, would be just a gradual, progressive desensitization and counter conditioning work to just dismantle and unravel that problem in a very gradual step by step method. Um, and that's not something I can do for you <laughs> over Facebook. Because I don't know all the nuances, you know. Uh, so, again, I would say get in touch with a local pro. Some things I can tell you, though, would be a good pro is going to tell you, like I said, is going to sit down and lay out all those things and really have a, uh, an honest conversation with your daughter about the pieces uh, that are operating in this in this situation. And then, of course, we have to make accounts for safety. Uh, you know, so that nobody gets hurt. Um, the dog is lunging, snarling, growling, and will bite. That means that we have to assess a bite history. And anytime we assess a bite history, you know, bites are negative indicators. We have to assess the bite history. Uh, we need honest um, rundown of every single time that a bite has occurred. And then we also need to assess the damage of those bites so that we can get a feel for the dog's bite inhibition. Now, uh, it's not that I'm on YouTube right now for this one. You guys can really see where the bite inhibition work that we do as puppies plays into this. So in a nutshell, I'm just going to throw this out there for people that maybe haven't watched those videos or uh, aren't, you know, uh, following that particular part of the conversation. So bite inhibition is uh, like an unconscious limiting in a dog's brain that describes how hard they use their mouth when they use their mouth to solve a problem. Uh, this is something that can really only be wired in uh, pre-adolescence. And upon the onset of adolescence, the brain chemistry changes, and there are currently no training methods in existence that can alter that level of force. So uh, when we take a bite history and we are assessing the damage, we use the wound pathology from the bites to assess the level of the bite. Um, dog to human, we use the Dunbar scale, uh, which was developed by Dr. Ian Dunbar. Uh, incidentally, dog to dog, we use the Shannon scale, which was developed by Kara Shannon. Uh, the Dunbar scale has six steps. So, for example, a one would be like... Uh, 
just a, an air snap or a muzzle punch, no teeth involved, no contact. Uh, whereas a six would be, you know, somebody died. Ones and twos are really kind of non-issues. Uh, we know that that's a fairly safe dog to work with. Threes, we have to really start being careful and put some safety layers in place. Fours are like, hey, we cannot make mistakes. Uh, fives and sixes, like I wouldn't even work with a dog with fives and sixes. So uh, again, that's going to be part of the process because that determines the kind and the amount of safety layers that you have in place while you work. Uh, so, for example, if you have a dog that lunges, snarls, growls, and bites, and they're all level ones and twos, well, you should still take safety precautions, and you should still design the hierarchy to keep the dog under threshold. But we understand that that's a really safe dog to work with. If you have threes and fours in the bite history, that means that you have to have much stricter safety layers in place, much more restrictive safety layers in place. And that means that the design of the hierarchy is a lot more explicitly detailed uh, and probably moves in much smaller increments. Um, so, uh, gosh, uh, the only things I can tell you right now to help you with that would be, you know, uh, never correct incidents of resource guarding. And I know that there's people that that's going to sound bananas to, but you got to understand that when there's resource guarding, a dog is communicating to you that uh, they are anxious about something. And if you then turn around and confront them, you're confirming that they were right to be anxious about it. That I would say in 99 out of 100 instances of resource guarding that I see and that my colleagues have seen, uh, anytime people start getting real confrontational about resource guarding, it balloons up really fast. In fact, we've got a case that we're working, uh, going to start working right now, uh, where um, we dealt with uh, this family when the dog was a puppy, uh, had some resource guarding with a bull, and we said, hey, don't confront the dog. I want you to do A, B, and C. They decided that they knew better, and here we are. A year later, and the dog is giving level three and four bites uh, because they just keep, it's just turning into an arms race. You know, the dog is like, well, you're not listening to me. I have to get to here. And they're like, well, you're being a bad dog. I have to get to here. And he's like, you're not listening to me. I have to take it to here. And it's just, it, it's, it's a really toxic situation. Um, and it's going to be very hard for us to work through um, for a lot of reasons. So, uh, don't correct those kinds of things. Um, one of my favorite behaviorists, Shirag Patel, uh, is famous for saying, uh, dogs will start to shout if we don't listen to them whisper. Uh, and so when a dog tells you, hey, I'm uncomfortable right now, the best, most productive thing you can do is believe them and not criminalize them and be like, okay, I hear you. Thank you for letting me know before this turns into trouble. Uh, and then we work through that progressively and sensitively uh, on the other end of it. So there you go. Uh, there's my sermon on <laughs> on uh, resource guarding. Uh, but definitely do, you're at the level with lunging, snarling, growling, and biting. You really need to get in touch with a local pro uh, and suss out all those fine, fine details with that. Um, let's see, this thing scooted up here real quick. Why does it do that? Every time I... Uh, There we go. There's Laura. Happy Friday from Lauren Goldie, currently in St. Paul, Minnesota. Man, you guys are all over the place. On our way home from Texas, Goldie's been doing great. A little difficulty with the elimination, but getting the job done. <laughs> Super, you guys. Well, I hope you have a safe trip on the way home. It's good to see you, Laura. Uh, it's my girl, Jan, and now she's on Facebook. <laughs> Uh, Jackie said, how do you get an adult to stop mouthing history unknown? Okay. So when you have an adult, it's, uh, it, we deal with puppy biting and mouthing differently than we do with an adult. So, uh, I'm sure you guys have seen the puppy video and we had give the pain response and then we bail out when it's too intense and we do that repetitively until the dog changes their behavior because they don't want us to leave. Uh, by the time you get to an adult dog, then it's really an obedience and manners issue. Um, 
And we just, the main thing that we use in most cases is differential reinforcement. Um, so I want you to look at it this way, and this is kind of an interesting uh, lesson in general on a lot of annoying behaviors. So uh, things that we find annoying when dogs interact with us, specifically jumping and mouthing are probably the two most common things. Those are problematic mainly because those are part of a dog's vocabulary. Like you watch dogs interacting with each other. They do that to each other all the time. They're always jumping on each other and they're always mouthing each other. And so it's difficult because then they turn around and want to interact with us in, a, you know, in their native language. And we have to be like, oh, no, 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 we, we, don't, we don't do that here. And they're like, well, that's weird. Maybe I should just do it more so you can get on board. Um, the other thing to understand about that too is that uh, I'm assuming you understand how reinforcement works. Well, reinforcement can come from the environment. It doesn't necessarily have to be just all treats or toys or praise and stuff like that. Any behavior that is reinforced by the environment will either be maintained or will increase in frequency. Uh, so sometimes that uh, reinforcement is in the form of uh, attention. Sensory stimulation, uh, access to tangibles. Uh, those are basically the three main motivators as far as um, reinforcement from the environment goes. You know, so if we give treats to a dog when we have them do stuff, that's access to a tangible. If we praise a dog, that's attention. And if we pet a dog, that's sensory stimulation. But those things come from the environment too. It's not just us. So very commonly, things like jumping and mouthing are reinforced by the environment. Which means that they're extremely resistant to extinction. Now, extinction is what happens when dogs are mouthing or jumping and, and the internet tries to tell you like, well, you know, just turn your back and ignore them. Uh, you know, uh, make sure you don't make any eye contact or talk, talk to them until they stop. And that's not bad advice. It's just you got to understand that there's more to it than that. And so when they do that, they're trying to remove all the reinforcement for those behaviors, hoping that they will extinguish behaviors that don't receive reinforcement tend to become extinct. That's the mathematical equation. Real life is not necessarily that clean. So behaviors like jumping and mouthing usually receive reinforcement from the environment, not just from you, right? And here's the other thing. They're usually on uh, already what's called a lean reinforcement schedule, which means that they don't need hardly anything just to maintain them. So it could be you and the eight people you live with are not giving them any reinforcement and grandma comes over and gives them reinforcement and that's enough to maintain it for everybody. Or, you know, uh, you come home and your dog is doing that stuff and you're trying to ignore it. And then you're like, God, would you stop it? Well, that's attention that sometimes that's enough to reinforce it, uh, makes it very difficult. So the alternate then is then we go to differential reinforcement. We acknowledge that this is an issue that we are not going to realistically probably get rid of all the reinforcement in the environment. And so then our other tack is that we're going to use differential reinforcement. And when we use differential reinforcement, we're supersizing other things that we like better, right? Uh, that appeals to this really cool thing in psychology called the matching law. And the matching law says that organisms tend to gravitate towards opportunities for greater reinforcement. So like if I put a $5 bill on the table and a $20 bill on the table, and I'm like, look, uh, you can only have one, Jackie. Well, you're going to pick the $20 bill. So we understand that I'm probably not going to be able to keep the $5 bills from tumbling out <laughs> of the tree when your dog shakes it. I just have to understand that, help the dog understand that there are opportunities for $20 and $50 bills by doing other things. So how do we do that? Well, you can start by just uh, reinforcing anything that is not mouthing, right? Uh, if, uh, they come to mouth you and you're like, Hey, come on, don't do that. That doesn't work on me. Right. And then, uh, they kind of, uh, turn sideways in front of you. Like, Hey, I really like that. I'm going to give you tons of attention and petting for that. That's great. Oh, good. Now you're biting me. Okay. All right. All right. Now, Hey, you stopped. I like that. Could you give me something else? What about uh, try a sit? Oh my God. That's fantastic. You know? And it's just this kind of 
constant conversation that you have, and that's really key is it's got to be conversational. Uh, this conversation you're having about like, hey, look, this works a lot better for you than this other crap you're doing. Like, and you kind of over time start to see that shift where they're doing it. Uh, now, sometimes, you know, you'll see uh, online advice again will say like, well, tell them to stop and then make them sit. Again, that's not wrong, but the real magic isn't going to happen until the dog starts making those decisions on their own. And so even if you're going to, in the moment, you know, block something, which is appropriate, and then ask for something else, which is appropriate, in your head, you've got to be the long-term goal is to shift them over to making those decisions on their own. So we remove a lot of the scaffolding, uh, you know, like training wheels. I'm going to tell you to stop. And then I'm going to tell you to do something else. Those are your training wheels. Eventually, we got to get those training wheels off. So I want you to make those decisions on your own. And so you can kind of do testers. You know, once you kind of start to see that your dog is anticipating certain things, be like, hey, stop, stop. That doesn't work on me. I don't, I'm not going to interact with you while you're doing that crap. And then just kind of hang out and deactivate and see what they do. Sometimes they're going to jump on you. Sometimes they're going to try to mouth on you and they'll be more persistent because that stuff works if they're more persistent. You're a lot more interesting if they're annoying you. But you get those little gems, you get those little nuggets where they'll kind of stop and they'll think for a second, then they'll go, hmm, and they'll offer you a sit, and you better <laughs> act like they won the lottery. Like, yes, that's what I wanted. That's wonderful. That's fantastic. That's super. Uh, and that's where the real magic is going to happen is once they start to anticipate and make some of those decisions on their own, that's how you know you're making that shift. So, uh, you know, we have DRO, which is differential reinforcement of any other behavior. Uh, you have DRA, which is differential reinforcement of an alternate behavior. So those are some specifics, a little bit more specific. And then you have DRI, which is differential reinforcement of incompatible behaviors, uh, which is very, very specific. Uh, so DRI is usually what we use for jumping. Uh, so we would ask dogs to do like auto sits uh, or to train them to come in sideways across us because both of those are incompatible with jumping. With mouthing, uh, you've got a lot more options, uh, but just start with just easy, easy stuff, you know. Uh, anything that the dog does that is not mouthing, you know, make sure you're really putting a lot of focus on that and then really trying as much as you can to be just completely dead to them while they're mouthing you. You know, just stay cool. Don't jump around and flail your hands a lot because that's exciting. Don't yell at them because that just activates them more, you know, just be as cool as a cucumber as you can and have a contrast between, hey, you're mouthing me, it's not that interesting, hey, you're doing other things, now it's really interactive. Um, and so uh, I hope that's helpful for you. I kind of went off the rails on that one. Ariel said, that's very helpful. We'll work on that distance part and decrease the distance accordingly. Yep, that's great. Good, good, good. Uh, Lisa, I forgot to say that. Uh, hi from Connecticut. Hey, welcome. Thank you, Lisa. Awesome. Uh, Amelia, what do you think about puppy classes for an 11 week old puppy? Yes. My veterinary is against, even at the puppy class to sure all puppies are more or less the same age. Uh, no, I would absolutely, I would absolutely go for it. Uh, I don't know why your veterinarian would be against that. Um, I mean, it depends. Some of that depends on how well the classes are run and how savvy the instructors are with puppy development. Um, you know, I think good classes have uh, both a lot of structure. Uh, good puppy classes have some off-leash time that, again, is very structured. It just shouldn't be a free-for-all. Uh, and good puppy classes uh, also have a focus on teaching the owners how to get and maintain puppy focus because that's a long-term thing. Uh, assuming they are meeting those criteria, I absolutely, if you have, if you were local and you said, Hey, I have an 11 week old puppy, I'd be like, I have a puppy class for you. Uh, so yeah, I, I am all for it, uh, early and often. Uh, captain fantastic. I have a German shepherd, a year and a half old whines and barks at everything went on leash. How can I settle him down and get his attention? Uh, Wines and barks at everything went on leash. Well, um, 
I would need some more context about uh, the kinds of things that are making him do that. And then I'm assuming because you said on leash, he doesn't do that off leash, um, like in a yard or inside the house or something like that. Um, but without sounding like I'm, uh, hold on, where's my coaster? My wife saw me setting this uh, glass down on the coffee table here without a coaster. She'd kill me. Uh, I mean, I would always default to engagement, uh, our engagement drill. Um, <clears throat> we have our long uh, kind of 40-minute video on engagement training on the YouTube. Uh, and I would really uh, recommend starting with that because that stuff not only builds the engagement, the sustained engagement, it not only teaches the communication system and not only teaches the dog how to target and move into reinforcement, it also teaches the dog uh, some confidence, helps them develop confidence. And you can always append things to your engagement work to build confidence, like, uh, you know, like your prolonged attention, your auto sits. Uh, you can start incorporating uh, heel maneuvers, uh, things like that pretty quickly into those things, assuming that they've been taught on the side. Um, but anytime we have a dog that's kind of whines and barks and is real external, uh, we start kind of defaulting right to engagement because most of the time that's the part that's deficient. Uh, you know, if we're in a neutral area and we're holding food, yeah, we get some good engagement. But you find a lot of the time that when dogs go into public, settings they become extremely external uh and then what we have to do is re-attain our engagement in those settings too like hey i i have stuff that's worth working for i have interesting things happening here too it's not just everything else um and so sometimes you just go into public places and you just do engagement drills uh and not really worry about the uh finer obedience pieces um, but without knowing more, that's where I would start is just uh, engagement, 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 engagement. I keep harping on that. Uh, and I think some people see it and they're not really sure. Like, well, you're just doling out treats. You, what are you doing? You're just a Pez dispenser. But I, I think that they just fail to see the foundation that you're building, that everything else we do builds off of that. And if that foundation is strong, everything else moves way, way, way faster. So. Uh, I'll drop a link to that video into the comments after the show for you. Uh, Sebastian, what are some good exercises for improving engagement for such a dog? Uh, well, uh, like I said uh, to Captain Fantastic there a second ago, that would really be about getting into uh, just straight up engagement drills. Um, so you can check out that video. Um, I'll link to that to you as well. In a nutshell, uh, essentially what we do is we uh, just find a neutral space to work in. We move around uh, in the space and we capture engagement. Now, that's really important that we capture it rather than prompting it. We don't want to prompt engagement because then they're just, we're kind of implying they only have to engage with us when we ask them to, which is great. But I want a dog that has just this ongoing, pervasive, pull to stay engaged with me, right? It's like we have this, uh, what Dr. Dunbar called an invisible bungee cord between us. And whenever the bungee cord gets tight, it snaps back and we get that re-engagement uh, automatically. So we move about the space. Uh, we just stay on their radar. When they orient to us, we mark it. Yes. And then we present a target for them to come get. And we work until, uh, they start offering the engagement more frequently. They're running into us uh, with some energy and some gusto. And, uh, you know, we're really kind of stacking on those larger kind of modular reward events so that uh, there's a lot of payout with, you know, access to tangibles, like I mentioned a bit ago, with some sensory stimulation, with some attention. Uh, and so there's a lot of payout for them to stay invested in working with us. And that's a great drill to do if you're doing in your neutral environments. You can take that drill and build a bunch of other things onto it. Like in the video, you'll see how we do the uh, auto sits and the find my face and some other neat skills. And you can do anything you want in that. We start every single training 
drill, even with my own dogs, with just a real quick engagement drill, just to get them warmed up and be like, hey, this is what we're doing right now. And they're like, Roger, Roger, got it. Um, and then, uh, you know, so for dogs that are kind of external, when we take them into public, then the, that's the very first thing we do. I'm not really worried about the pretty stuff, like the obedience stuff. I want the engagement first. So I'm just going to go into a public setting. Uh, I'm going to stay far enough away, make sure I'm watching that proximity and distance so that they're not too intensely overwhelmed and interested. And then we just do engagement, 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 engagement. And then when I'm getting solid engagement with public things, I can start doing the other stuff to make it look pretty. Uh, and then, of course, all the other considerations, phasing out food and, you know, getting on voice control and all that jazz. But you've got to start with that engagement drill first. So I'll link to that uh, for you after the show. Uh, hi, my Aussie puppy is 12 weeks and in the garden just eats everything. A personal trainer recommended a kennel for outside when I'm not home. Is it the right way or can I train him to stop destroying? Well, I mean, yeah, I would say that... Uh, I would say that safety and management, first and foremost, uh, is the most is the first thing you should do. Safety and management, which is just block access to those things. Uh, a twelve-week-old puppy does not have the cognitive ability or the self-control to not do that. They're not going to take the training. You know, that's going to be kind of an adolescent or post-adolescence thing. Uh, and also, I would uh, recommend that there's absolutely no reason a 12-week-old puppy should be outside when you're not at home. There's just absolutely no reason. That's that's 12-week-old puppy is a baby, uh, and that's like you know leaving a baby in the middle of the living room and going to work. It's just you, if you're not going to have the baby supervised, then the baby needs to be contained in a safe and protected environment. That's a pen. It's an indoor kennel. That's something like that. Um, so I would say you probably asking a little too much of the puppy right now. And um, if you want to go outside with the puppy for supervised things, then you can either have the puppy on leash, uh, or you can have a playpen, uh, or you know some kind of fencing around the garden, uh, or you know just some kind of management that way until the puppy's a little bit older and you can work on some of those things. Uh, Stacy Lynn says, hi, hi, Ian. Hey, how you doing, Stacy? Uh, Amar says, hi there. Just wondering if it's possible to teach any dog to fetch. I have a rescue lab who has no toy or training drive, retrieving drive. Uh, well, I mean, uh, ostensibly, you can develop that. I mean, every dog is going to have their own personal inclinations. Um, you know, labs already have that kind of genetic component, but I mean, you know, it's usually nature because of nurture. Um, so I would assume that there's ways that you can switch some of those things back on uh, by developing it slowly, just doing some uh, real quick back and forth drills. Um, so yeah, it's, it, it's theoretically possible, but you just have to understand that it might not, depending on the dog, uh, there's no guarantee that it'll get up to the level of, you know, uh, super retrieve. Depends on what you want to do with your retrieve, too. If you just want to toss a ball down the hallway, you know, that's one thing. Uh, I always, whenever I work with retrieval dogs, I always want to do things, you know, like pitching it into cover, making them look for it, uh, doing delays. I'm going to pitch it and wait and then send you after it. I'm going to throw a couple or three of them and send you after each one in succession. Uh, you know, I like to do other kinds of fun things like that just to challenge them. It's just a lot more enriching, but you know, it just depends on what you want to do with it. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, uh, a good way to start with that. Usually what we start with dogs that, uh, are kind of reluctant to retrieve is we just start, uh, kind of doing a boomerang ping pong kind of thing. So like, uh, I'll have the dog run over and get a treat, which is <laughs> integrated in my engagement stuff anyway. I'm like, zip, pop over and get it. And they get it. And then I toss the next one for them to come get. And as soon as they pick up that one, I have one for them to come over here. So I'm really getting them to run out and run back. Run out, run back. Run out, run back. Run out, run back. And so we're kind of just patterning that motor skill. Uh, and then another thing that I've done that seems to work pretty well to start off, uh, we, I've got a lab actually that I am doing some really neat retrieval stuff. And this is how I started him. 
Uh, so there's a little toy you can get on Amazon called Goodest Boy. And it's a retrieval dummy, but it's hollow. So you can unzip the dummy and then you can fill it with food. So like with this guy, with Cooper, uh, I took the retrieval dummy and I was like, hey, Cooper, look what I'm doing. And he, of course, he comes and was like, what are you doing? What do you got there? And we had already done this bit, 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 bit back and forth. So I opened it up and he watched me put a whole bunch of food into it. And then I closed it up and then I just tossed it like a couple feet from us. And I'm like, hey, Cooper, you got to get that. And of course, he got it and he went over and he nosed it around and he picked it up. And I'm like, hey, buddy, buddy, buddy. And then I reached out and I grabbed it. And then as soon as I got my hands on it, I'm like, wow, that's a great job. And he watched me open it up and pull it out. And I gave him some food. And then I zipped it back up. And I'm like, okay. And we did a few of those. And then he was picking it up and bringing it to me because he wanted me to open it up. Um, and once he kind of got that idea, then what I started doing was instead of opening the, the dummy up, I was pulling food out of my treat pouch. So I'd toss it. He'd bring it back to me. And then I'd praise him, and then I'd pull the food out of my treat pouch. So it stopped coming out of this. Uh, and then uh, once I could toss it maybe 10, 15 feet away and he was bringing it back, then we just transitioned over to regular retrieval dummies. Um, and, of course, by then, you know, we really could phase out the food because he was just so psyched about the retrieval thing. Um, it went pretty fast. But that that's one possible path. You know, it's not every dog is different. It's Training is a study of one. So, uh, but that's how I did it with that dog. And that might uh, might be a gateway for you too. Uh, hey, Jen. <laughs> Hi, Uncle Ian. Little Izzy Wigs. Little Izzy Wigs. I hope you guys are doing good. And uh, little Ruthie. Oh, love you guys. Love you guys. Um, Kathleen, hi, Ian. This is my first time tuning in. Welcome, Kathleen. We are bringing home our new eight-week-old pup tomorrow. I'm on your waiting list for upcoming puppy class to be scheduled. Whoa! Can't wait to get him started. Feel I'm all set to get him home. Uh, I've already raised a CGC and plan on doing all I can to help our noodle guy be the best he can be. Well, that is just awesome. I am so excited to have you guys in classes. That's just wonderful. Uh, great experience there, a canine good citizen dog. Um, and it looks like you've done a bunch of your homework and you're all ready to go. Uh, I'm psyched to have you. Um, incidentally, Kathleen, we will be, uh, we have been talking about the upcoming class schedule. So we're going to announce that probably fingers crossed this week. Um, and then we'll, um, we'll get in touch with you and, and get you signed up. So looking forward to it. Tamara said his name is Volt. Yeah, I know. I should have known better than naming him that. <laughs> That's cute. Uh, Cheryl says, I have, uh, hi everyone. I have a question. How would you train a 15 month old mix? Uh, and she is aggressive to other dogs. How would I go by helping her not be being her being not aggressive? Uh, well, I mean, that's a loaded question. I mean, there's a lot there. Just like when we talked about with the resource guarding stuff, there's a lot, a lot of details that we have to have I mean, I can give you kind of a general outline skeleton, but, you know, there's so many nuances that are unique to every, every, here's the thing. Like, so if you asked me like, okay, so what do you do for uh, food bowl guarding? Or what do you do for leash reactivity? Or what do you do, for, how do you teach a dog to heal? Or how do you uh, teach a dog to leave it? Or how do you, what do you do with uh, a dog that's fence fighting? Uh, you know, all these different kinds of training conundrums that people have. And so in my head, you know, I mean, I have templates, I have basic template, but templates are just kind of a pattern you follow, you know, like if you're like for carpentry or writing a letter or something like that, depends on what and how and why you're building the materials that you have to work with. So for every dog, we take the template and then we have to make customizations for that dog. Some dogs really need me to be, you know, super energetic and really lively and, you know, just hopping around and getting that and other dogs can't handle that. So I have to be much more understated and kind of move slowly or, or in smaller bits, you know, or maybe farther away or build their skills slowly. Uh, you know, it's just every dog is different. So in your case, you got a 15 month old, which is, uh, kind of later, mid to late adolescence, um, aggressive to other dogs. I'm assuming that's probably like a leash reactivity issue. Um, 
And so we usually deal with that uh, with our, we've got a couple of templates that we apply to that. One is tension control on the leash. And then the other one is uh, our boomerang, uh, which is a lot like engage, disengage, if you're familiar with that. Um, I would suggest without going into uh, a 40 minute diatribe on tension control and our boomerang, I would say take a look at the engage disengage drill. Uh, crap, I can't remember who. Ruth. Well, that's probably way off. I can't remember who who originally came up with engage disengage, but it's a solid it's a solid protocol as long as you're working far enough away so that the dog is stays under threshold. Um, you have safety layers in place, um, and then, uh, you know, you have good marker training so that you can really nail those things, whether you're using a clicker or like us, we use verbal markers. Yes, good and nope. Um, but engage, disengage is a really cool place to start. Um, if you're interested in some of the other stuff I mentioned, the tension control and the boomerang, uh, I have PDFs. Just shoot me an email. I'm happy to send those things to you. Um. But check out Engage Disengage. That's a really cool uh, our work. My boomerang is a, is really darn close to that. So a lot of times, if people are distant from us and they're not working from us, I'm like, just check that out. That's it's pretty solid. Um, it's a good way to get some traction on that. Uh, can you stop resource guarding between dogs with training? Ideally, yes. Uh, I'm going to say ostensibly, meaning that it's possible, uh, may or may not happen. It depends on the dog, depends on the environment that they have to work in, and uh, depends on uh, the training protocols that you're using. But uh, in most cases, yes. In most cases, yes. Um, now, a lot of this really depends uh, a lot. The success of any kind of treatment really depends. There's a lot of responsibility on the owners. Uh, and so if you if you find first you got to find a trainer that's going to help you design sensible and uh, intelligent hierarchies to deal with resource guarding. And it's going to help you work through when you're dog to dog, especially you have to work through, you know, safety and management, uh, setting up the training situations and all these moving parts. And then it really boils down to the follow through from the owner. I mean, you know, I tell people in my classes, the dogs tell us who's not doing their homework because you can tell, you know, uh, people that do the work and put the reps in see results. Other people are in week six and have not improved because they're not doing the work at home. Uh, and so that's really the biggest barometer of success is are you putting in the reps and are you doing the reps right? And are you doing what your trainer says? And did you find a good trainer? I guess that's the big part too. Uh, Jill, I, there I'll have to watch and catch up as we're almost in Canterbury having traveled all day to get here. Uh, now I know you've been to Canterbury, so I'll say hello to it for you. <laughs> Take care and have a good weekend. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, right. I know you can't see it, but right there I have the roof boss that I bought at the Canterbury gift shop, and it is a it's it's a tiny little medallion. It's called a roof boss. It's a little piece of art. It's about that thick, and it's made from stone from Canterbury Cathedral that was recovered when they were doing. Um, repair and recovery work on it and the carving on it is this really cool depiction of the knights killing thomas a beckett which is of course he was martyred at canterbury cathedral and that's you know a uh, big deal there and if you think about uh, the canterbury tales that's where they were headed was canterbury cathedral it was a pilgrimage to go see where thomas a beckett was martyr martyred so you know as a literary buff uh, when i was at canterbury i had to get my roof boss um uh, I'll have to show it to you sometime, Jill. So good. I'm going to help you. I'm glad you're having a good time. Uh, Lynn, hello from North Wales. No questions this week, but I'm listening and learning as usual. Thanks for stopping in, Lynn. Good to see you. Um, Kozizi? 
That's cool. I like that name. Hi, Ian. Great channel. Learn so much. Can you please do a video on greyhounds? What do you want to know about greyhounds? Uh, I love greyhounds. They're they're so funny. They're persnickety. They're funny uh, in a real dry sense of humor. Um, there's a really great uh, greyhound rescue locally called Forever Grey. Uh, and neat people that started it. Uh, and I still keep in touch with them once in a while. I see them, at, you know, when we go to dog functions, you know, ah, kind of thing. Um, and back when I very first started Simpatico, we did a basic class that was exclusively for greyhounds. It was really cool. We had, I think, 10 greyhounds in it. We had a much bigger space. It was massive, massive friggin' space. Um, and we did a class just for greyhounds. And we had to, you know, customize the uh, curriculum to fit the greyhounds. Uh, but it was a lot of fun. It was really neat. I love greyhounds. It's good stuff. Uh, what do you want to know about greyhounds? What would you like to know? Uh, Hannah, my uh, for those of you guys who don't know, she's my lead trainer here. Uh, I am echoing, please, folks, do not correct the growl. Please, please, please don't correct the, the growls. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Bear, how do you help a dog with dog's anxiety? Uh, I have a husky Akita German Shepherd pit bull rescue, and she's prone to peeing and very skittish. Well, that's a uh, confidence issue. In social situations, a lot of that is just uh, progressive uh, desensitization, where uh, you just expose them to varying levels of social situations and build confidence in those things. Uh, how do we build confidence? Uh, I know it's going to sound like I'm beating the drum. Engagement. You do engagement drills in there because, uh, look, a lot of the reason that there's fear and anxiety in social situations is when they just don't know what to do. And look, people are exactly the same. Uh, so when you get to uh, social situations, you know, like let's say, let's say you go to a party and you don't know anybody there uh, and, uh, you know, they're all you know, like maybe doctors and your uh, school teacher, you know, like, I don't know what the hell anybody's talking about here. I feel like an idiot that creates a lot of social pressure and that creates some anxiety. And that's kind of where dogs are. You know, they're like, I'm in a social situation. I don't know what the heck I'm supposed to do. And I feel like an idiot. Uh, and so then that can activate other behaviors, depending on whether they're kind of an internal dog or more of an external dog. So, you know, we go and we give them things to do. Like, hey, don't worry about all that other stuff. Just work with me. We're going to have some fun. We're going to make it really dynamic. It's going to be great. And then we're going to get the hell out of here. And we do some of that until, you know, their expectation changes. And then you can start building their skill set in different uh, contexts too. Like once you go and they start to go like, okay, I'm feeling a little comfortable. I, 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 can, I can do this. I, what are we doing together? And then you're like, great. Why don't we uh, practice some sits or some walking, some downstays, you know, some stuff that we would do in public. Um, in this safe place that you feel comfortable. And then if we get to some place that you don't feel comfortable, well, you know, I'm not really worried about you having to do any of that jazz. We'll just kind of work on some engagement pieces and just keep you moving. Um, and that's a really big takeaway from things too, is I always try to keep a fearful dog moving as much as I can because uh, movement metabolizes stress chemicals faster. Dogs are active creatures and persistent energetic movement is a survival trait that translates over. So if we can get them moving, and funnel that movement into engagement with us, uh, it really starts to kind of overwrite uh, what their impressions are of those situations in their brain. Um, and then if your dog won't move or won't engage, it's probably too intense and they're in too deep and then just get them out of there. Um, so it's just progressive, it's gradual, and we just kind of do that and make it real fun and dynamic uh, and keep them moving. And then, uh, you know, that's how you build confidence is give them, give them things they can do, things they can rely on, uh, change their anticipation of what that social situation is going to look like, and then add to their tool set, build their skills as you go. So, uh, Captain Fantastic said, Cheryl, a muzzle. Uh, I assume that's for Cheryl's question on the biting. Uh, I would disagree with that because the muzzle is just a safety and management piece, uh, and that doesn't teach anything. Uh, if you have to take the dog into a situation like, you know, a vet's office or grooming's office, sure, then a muzzle is uh, an appropriate management tool, but it does absolutely nothing for training uh, for the long term. So it would only be something you would use in an in 
situation where, uh, you know, you can't really avoid that situation and you, the dog is maybe, you know, tearing clothes or leaving red marks and stuff like that. Um, uh, just because they're being a fool, but, uh, as for training goes, that's not really good for training. And of course, if you're going to use a muzzle for anything, you have to spend time habituating the dog to the muzzle that you can't really just throw it on and hope for the best. Um, so things to consider lots of moving parts. Um, We've got a truckload of comments and questions here, uh, and we're just not going to be able to get to everybody. Uh, and this thing scooted up. It always does this. Wow, it really went way the hell up there. Uh, I'm going to hit this one. Blondie, uh, I have a seven-month-old Shih Tzu puppy that is sometimes very reactive with other dogs. When he becomes reactive, I'll pick him up, move him away, and reassure him. Is this the right approach? Well, it's not for the long term. That would just be a safety and management thing. Uh, you know, it just depends on how intense the situation are because, you know, sometimes you are in a situation where the dog is under threshold. They still have some of their cognitive functions online, and you can get some good training to happen. Uh, but once they go over threshold, once they've hit their limit, once something is too intense and they're just stuck in that zone, you know, their cognitive functions go offline. They're just all brainstem and spinal cord and just blah, then moving them away is probably the best thing because then it's just management at that point. Just get out of dodge. Don't don't try to force the issue at that point. But I would recommend for the long term that you, uh, you know, with a trainer, work up a plan. Uh, let them show you how to do some things like, you know, engage, disengage, uh, our system of tension control and boomerang, uh, things like that. And then work, find places and ways that you can, or opportunities to do that at, at a distance where your Shih Tzu puppy can keep it together. Um, and that's something you definitely want to be proactive about because that's typically those things just increase if they're not, uh, if they're not dealt with. Uh, Ramiro, hey Ian, our one-year-old Corgi has the attention span of a goldfish while out on walks. It's very hard to keep her focused outside. What would you recommend? Uh, engagement, engagement, go back and do engagement, attain proficiency in your engagement, and then apply your walking, uh, your walking skills over the top of better engagement. Um, so I'll link to that video for you too there. Um, we always, uh, you know, one of my favorite things, uh, I like Michael Ellis and he has said, uh, play in new places and train in familiar ones. So uh, we can treat engagement like it's a play game. My dogs think engagement is just pure fun and play. Uh, and so you can go to certain places, make sure you're developing your walking in you know other contexts. We usually start indoors, so you have that framework. Then you build your engagement in the new places, and then you overlay your walking skills on top of that framework. If you try to do the walking skills without the engagement framework, that's like trying to teach somebody how to drive a car on the freeway. Like <laughs> you need to build the, the you need to build something in the empty parking lot before you go to the freeway. You know what I mean? Uh, so engagement. Uh, hi, Ian. I'm a big fan from Brazil and my dog is doing great. Thanks to your videos. Quick question. Have you taught a dog to do a backflip? I have not. No, <laughs> I think it's an amazing trick to teach my border collie. Uh, I, I have not, uh, that is not something in my, uh, <laughs> in my tool kit. Uh, I would look at, uh, Kira Sundance, uh, or, uh, I'm sure there's a million videos for doing tricks with border collies out there. Uh, Kira Sundance, I think probably has a write up for that in one of her books. She's got lots of awesome stuff like that. <laughs> a backflip. Olive, do you want to do a backflip? She's like, no, I just want to learn how to nap. <laughs> Alan says, I love when Ian does voices dogs. <laughs> I do that a lot. I do. Uh, okay guys, Hey, we are after the hour. There's lots and lots of great content, uh, comments and questions. Uh, I'm going to try really hard to, uh, go through and, and at least give everybody a thumbs up or a shout out or something for them. God bless. There's a lot here. Uh, so, uh, guys, uh, I hope that you have a wonderful weekend. 
Uh, I hope that you stay well, stay safe. Uh, give your doggies all a kiss on the nose for me. Uh, let's one more time, little olive oil. Oh, my baby girl. Mm. Oh, she's like, oh my God, daddy, why'd you wake me up? Mm. God, you're warm. You feel good. Maybe we'll take a nap together. What do you think? Mwah. Oh, my God. Oh, little girl. Oh, she's just a little rag doll. Uh, give your dogs a kiss on the nose for me and uh, keep learning. Keep practicing. I will see you next time, guys. I love you all. Thanks for stopping by. Appreciate it.